I think Blessed Miriam Teresa's essential message is that each one of us is called to a life of holiness. She has become a model for many people of attempting to live out God's will. But on our own soil now, in the very places where we walk, uh, to know that someone achieves such intimacy with God is a good inspiration for all of us. From miracle workers to martyrs, to those ordinary people living extraordinary lives of heroic virtue, these are the people that make us wonder if someday they might be saints. On March 26, 1901, Teresa Demjanovic was born in the city of Bayonne, New Jersey. Her parents, Alexander and Johanna, were hardworking and devout immigrants, in 1884 joining a flood of other young couples to form an enclave of Slovak families. She was known to be, you know, a vi a, an obedient, a quiet child. Teresa was the youngest of five living children two babies died early in the marriage. Her siblings Mary, John, Anna, and Charles recognized their baby sister for her goodness, but did not notice the depth of Teresa's spirituality. She was a very holy person even when she was a childhood. That from the time she was about three years old, she had an understanding of the meaning of the Trinity, which we always considered a mystery. And I think that it's safe to say that she spent her whole life in the presence of the Trinity in some mystical manner that is not afforded to most of us. It's through her parents very much that embedded that into her. They were, they were deeply prayerful. They were rooted in sacred scripture. So she was all her life long pursuing that. The family belonged to the Byzantine Ruthenian Catholic Church, St. John the Baptist in Bayonne. Teresa was baptized and confirmed in that rite when she was five days old. She attended religion classes every day after school and made her first Holy Communion at that parish at the age of 12. In Teresa's life, she became a bridge between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. The Demjanovic family moved, and the children took part in the liturgy, social events, and activities at St. Vincent Roman Catholic Parish, with Teresa attending daily Mass there and experiencing a deepening of her spiritual life. Uh, she was generous. She would do anything to help anybody. Her mother was ill, and her health was gradually deteriorating. Responsibilities as nurse and housekeeper fell on the shoulders of Teresa, who accepted these duties cheerfully. All of this time, Teresa had been looking forward to a life as a contemplative religious. She wanted to enter the Carmelite sisters, and they did not accept her because she had a significant vision impairment, and they did a lot of embroidering of vestments, which required a very clear vision. At her mother's dying wish, she enrolled at the College of St. Elizabeth a school sponsored by the Sisters of Charity. When she first arrived at the college, it was a totally different social scene from what she had been used to. But gradually, they began to recognize, again, the uniqueness of this woman. And so it was often heard, if you need help, go to treat, as they called her, because people knew that they could go to her, that they could count on her, that she often leaned over and helped out where somebody needed help. And so in little ways, as well as in big ways, I think charity became synonymous with her. In college, she was involved in everything. And so treat, 
uh, became Art Editor of the Yearbook. Treat uh, was on the track team. Treat was a member of the Sodality. She was an excellent student. Uh, in fact, we have in the archives a term paper that she wrote, and the professor had written across the front of it, I saved this paper because I believed that one day she would be declared a saint. And she often returned to the chapel to pray and to say the Stations of the Cross, as the sisters did customarily. She said the Stations were such devotion that she drew the attention of the General Superior, who asked one of the sisters, who is that girl who says the Stations with such devotion? Throughout the history of the Catholic Church, there have been over 300 cases of saints and blesseds claiming visions of the Virgin Mary. Most of these aren't investigated or validated, but because they're claimed by holy people, perhaps they are authentic experiences. And they're recorded in the hagiographies or saint biographies throughout history. One night as she prayed, it became very light around uh, where she was looking. And uh, the Blessed Virgin appeared to her. She, she was really deeply, deeply moved. And uh, one of her, her college friends came in to say good night, which they did each night to each other, and uh, found her like practically immobile and really not able to respond to her. And she said, uh, is there something wrong? And Teresa said, no, but I think I had a vision of Mary. The college has preserved that room and a plaque on the wall. While she waited for God to reveal his plan for her life, Teresa began at St. Aloysius Academy in Jersey City where she was an excellent teacher who maintained her calm and cheerful disposition. Her best sister friend at the college advised her not to wait too long if she wanted to join the Sisters of Charity. One of the friends encouraged her on a visit after she graduated to make a novena to Our Lady before the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And when she saw the sisters renewing their vows on December 8th, she realized she was called to be a Sister of Charity of New Jersey. On March 17, 1925, Sister Miriam Teresa donned the novice habit and cap and was given her religious name, Miriam after the Blessed Virgin Mary, and Teresa after her baptismal patron and favorite saint, Teresa of Avila. Sister Miriam Teresa was an exemplary novice. She kept all the rules and customs of the community, even the smallest ones, and prayed the required spiritual exercises and kept her housekeeping duties conscientiously. She was convinced that this was the congregation that God willed her to become part of. She never wavered from that. She believed that she was to become a Sister of Charity, not simply for her sanctification, but also for the sanctification of this congregation. On February 2nd, 1925, Teresa's father died, and she did not enter religious life on that day as originally planned. Even though she was willing to begin her novitiate, the sisters postponed her entry until February 11th, the feast of Our Lady of Lourdes. She uh, taught the classroom as a teacher for a while. And teaching for her was in addition to everything else that she was doing. At the same time that she had charges throughout the convent as all the other novices did. Miriam Teresa had a great devotion to the little flower, St. Therese of Lisieux. Her friends say that <clears throat> when they went into her bedroom in college days, they'd always see uh, the autobiography of the little flower open there. Uh, the, the two books they saw in her room uh, always were the, the autobiography and the Bible. There is a wooded area called Nazareth Park near the convent. One day in the late afternoon, Sister Miriam Teresa, told by her mistress to go out and get some fresh air, couldn't find another novice to accompany her as darkness approached. So she prayed to the newly canonized St. Therese of Lisieux. She asked St. Therese to walk with her. To her surprise, the little flower came in person to accompany her. Afterwards, she gave an account to Sister Marie Dolores 
who said that Sister Miriam Teresa's face shone with a heavenly radiance when she spoke to her about it that evening. A new chaplain and confessor arrived, a Benedictine priest, Reverend Benedict Bradley. After hearing her confessions, he quickly realized he was advising a true mystic and a very holy person. Father Benedict uh, admonished her not to share the secrets uh, of her life of intimate union with God with Sister Mary Ellen. Part of Father Benedict's duties was to give weekly spiritual conferences. Realizing Sister Miriam Teresa's holiness, he asked the Mother Superior if the young novice could write a series of conferences for him. It was not an easy situation where um, she was given approval to, for example, write the conferences for Father Benedict. The novice mistress held a great deal of authority over the novices and whether or not they would be allowed to make vows. Lest Sister Mary Ellen decide this was not the place that she should be. So Teresa was caught between Father Benedict and Sister Mary Ellen. Sister Mary Ellen had no idea that Teresa was writing these conferences. The Mother General knew it, but her novice mistress did not. Teresa was sitting there listening to Father Benedict give her conferences to the novices and then hear their reactions and not be able to say, oh yeah, I know that. <laughs> Teresa developed a, a throat problem and she was sent to St. Joseph's Hospital in Patterson. In November of 1926, Sister Miriam Teresa's condition was diagnosed as tonsillitis and she was operated on. When she returned to the convent, the other sisters noticed how weak she was. She was then sent probably in February or March to St. Elizabeth Hospital in Elizabeth, New Jersey. They finally decided that she had appendicitis and operated, but unfortunately the appendix had burst and she um, died of peritonitis. But not before um, Father Benedict went down and received her vows uh, as they say, in articulo mortis, at the hour of death. Sister Miriam Teresa Demjanovich died on May 8, 1927, at the age of 26, after only two years as a religious sister. Before she died, her, her confessor said, give me your work and let me take it. In, in her understanding of the charism of charity, um, in her willingness to make God's love known in the world and for her to step back. She gave him her thoughts, her feelings, very personal uh, part of her uh, to carry on. Had them published as a Greater Perfection, a book of 26 chapters of her uh, conferences. Uh, that has been translated into 10 or 12 different languages and really got her uh, known throughout the, the world. Her conferences are still considered to be a masterpiece of theology and spirituality uh, in a woman who really did not have a great deal of formal training in theology. Ever since she uh, passed away, people were visiting her tomb. Since the day of her death, uh, people have been uh, turned into for intercession. So she was very well known, uh, even at the time of her dying, for her sanctity. All of the schools uh, began to have the children pray for the beatification and canonization of um, Sister Miriam Teresa. We have literally boxes of petitions to Miriam Teresa through the years. In 1945, the Bishop of Patterson petitioned Rome for permission to begin the investigative process for the cause for Sister Miriam Teresa on the diocesan level. That's when they seriously started doing uh, interviews with people who knew her. In addition to interviews being conducted and testimonies gathered, her writings needed to be scrutinized to make sure there were no inconsistencies with the teachings of the Catholic Church. Documents attesting to her holiness had to be signed and witnessed. The church wants to be certain that the person possesses all of the qualities that make for 
what we call a saint. An academic position paper, the Positio, was then needed to be assembled and sent to Rome in 2002. It contained a biography of the candidate and documented her virtues, including letters, writings, and eyewitness accounts. It then goes to theologians and cardinals who will examine it. All of which go into the report that ultimately goes to the Pope, who is the decision maker. On May 10, 2012, 10 years after the submission of the Positio to Rome, Pope Benedict XVI promulgated the decree establishing that Sister Miriam Teresa Demjanovic had indeed lived a life of heroic virtue and would be designated as venerable. This set the stage for a possible future beatification and canonization. In order for Miriam Teresa to be beatified, the cause needed to find one miraculous cure that was worked through her singular intercession. The church was moving very slowly, uh, partly because uh, in order to have a beatification, much less a canonization, miracles are needed. The League received many, many letters attesting to miracles, some of which really looked very positive and some of which probably would not have passed muster with Rome. It takes a long time for the church to accept that something was indeed miraculous and that you can't explain it in any human way. The Catholic Church still uses a very strict standard when looking at medical miracles. The criteria was established by Prospero Lambertini, an Italian cardinal and later pope born in the 1600s. The cure must be instantaneous, complete, and lasting, and there can be no medical treatment that relates to the cure. In 1970, a woman wrote a letter indicating that in 1963, she believed a miracle had occurred. Somebody received it, put it in the file. Instead of going into the file folder, it went between two files, and it was on the bottom of the drawer. In 1998, uh, a sister, um, Frances Marie Cassidy, was cleaning out a filing cabinet, and she found this letter in between two other folders. Now, this is 27 years later. So she came running down the hall downstairs here to me and Sister Mary and Jose. Look what I found, look what I found. And we read it and we say, oh my goodness, maybe this is the miracle that we're looking for. The miracle that they found involved the loss of eyesight of a young boy, Michael Menser, due to macular degeneration. But he regained 20-20 vision through the intercession of Miriam Teresa Demjanovic. We had five children. Michael was number three of the five children. We were living in Pennsylvania. Some people thought he was shy, but he was really quiet and to himself because of his vision. God intervenes and he chose Michael Menser and his eyes <laughs> because I would be standing there fixing dinner and saying Hail Mary's all day long for the kids. <laughs> in 1963, he was having headaches in school and the nurse sent him a note and the family took him to see a Dr. Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan examined him and said he thought he had some kind of a congenital problem. Fifteen months later, he goes to see Dr. Vincent Carter in Teaneck, New Jersey. At this point, he had walked into a car. He's playing hooky from school, and he's getting into more trouble. And he makes the diagnosis of bilateral macular degeneration. The sisters in the school had been praying uh, to Miriam Teresa, for Michael, specifically for Michael, that his eyesight would improve. It just so happens that his third grade teacher at the time is the director of the Sister Miriam Teresa League for that convent and that church. So one day she sent Michael home with the pamphlet and a round memento, as we called it then, with just a tiny hair of Blessed Miriam Teresa. In a 2014 interview with NBC, Michael Menser reflected on the miracle that was happening to him. She gave me, uh, she just said, here, give this to your mother, and it was a prayer card and uh, the memento. And I kept trying to look at it, trying to focus, you know, with my peripheral vision, but I, obviously I couldn't get details on it. Michael tells us that on his way home, he looked at that and he said, oh, that's a hair. 
His eyesight was diagnosed as 2400. And I looked up and I saw an orb in the middle, but it didn't hurt my eyes. I thought it was the sun. But then when I looked back down at the memento in the card, uh, I moved my finger over a little bit and I could see the hair in the memento. And he said, sister said to give this to you. And he was looking at me directly, not from the side or anything, his eyes down, no, directly at me. His eyes were sparkling and his face looked entirely different. He had a, a very happy look on his face, smiling. When he handed me that and he looked at me, I knew he was healed. We took him back and Dr. Carter looked in his eyes and he said, somebody in your family's been praying. <laughs> and I told him about the sisters and what happened with Michael. She went to Will's Eye Institute. The doctor said, why did you bring him? This boy's vision is 20-20. Two were pediatric ophthalmologists, two general. And each of them said they had never heard of anyone being cured of macular degeneration. And ultimately, 19 ophthalmologists examined the medical records, all of whom declared, this is medically unexplainable. The report was sent to Pope Francis, who declared on December 17, 2013, that this was truly a miracle. It was very much a confirmation of faith. I mean, we know God works miracles. Uh, you read about them in the Bible. But when we find a miracle happening that's verified right in your own backyard, uh, it's a reminder of how close God is to us and how much he's involved in our lives. Miriam Teresa, then venerable Miriam Teresa, deserved to be called blessed. And the date of October 4th, um, 2014 was set to be the day of her beatification, the first time in the United States. The beatification process was under the Diocese of Patterson. So we actually handled all the paperwork going over. It was a very exciting time for all of us. When we heard back from Rome, we were very happy. It was a, a wonderfully joyous occasion for the people of New Jersey that a Bayonne girl, a Jersey girl, could actually rise to this level in the church. After the pontificate of John Paul II, beatifications were held where the blessed lived and died. Blessed Miriam Teresa Demjanovic was the very first person to be beatified on American soil. I was afraid nobody was gonna come. Thousands came. All of the major television um, channels came asking for interviews. For me, the greatest gift was the wonderful gift of community. All of our sisters, some in wheelchairs, some on crutches, all came to be part of it. It was, uh, f it was another step forward in, in God's love for me. Um, I couldn't quite believe it was happening. We still now think, did it really happen? And, and it did. Um, and it happened with great joy. Michael Menser was there, and he uh, carried the relic up uh, and presented that to Cardinal Amato, and we immortalized that on the wall that we have in the chapel now um, to remind us all of the history of this journey from uh, her birth up to the beatification. Her beatification is a, is a validation of her belief that everyone is called to holiness, that the fullness of God resides in every person. Once canonized, Miriam Teresa Demjanovic will join Elizabeth Ann Seton and Catherine Drexel as the only American-born saints in history. Before that can happen, the cause must identify one more healing miracle in order that Blessed Miriam Teresa Demjanovic can one day be declared a saint. All we need is one more miracle. She's already been declared a holy woman, and we already have a miracle supporting that. I not only have great hope, I have great confidence. Uh, God doesn't abandon us. He raises up for us exactly the models that we need. And she's just a perfect example for us to follow today. So I am I'm very assured of the fact that very quickly uh, she'll be canonized. That to me would be greatly beneficial to the Catholic Church and to the world in general um, if in fact God chooses to have her recognized as a saint. To all of us, 
she's already a saint. You know, she had her ups and her downs and her hopes and her dreams and her disappointments uh, and her failures, but she, um, she did her best and, and she lived a short life and she did what was asked of her. I believe she is a saint, who she was, a very simple person, a person who loved God, a person who tried to do God's will. Blessed Miriam Teresa undoubtedly was a saintly person and deserving of the honor. Miriam Teresa believed with all her heart that every single person was called to holiness. What, no matter who you were, no matter what you did, no matter what your background was, no matter what your age was, she believed this. This was years before Vatican II. So how does a 23-year-old say, a 24-year-old, really understand um, that each person is, is loved fully by God and is called uh, to live out that fullness in who they are? Sometimes you can think of heroism, you think of extraordinary things, but her main point, and it's something that attracts everybody, is to do the will of God where you are and there could be no other way to get closer to God. So I think the message of her life and also the few writings that she left behind are something that's totally applicable to anybody in any state of life. This has been They Might Be Saints. I'm Michael O'Neill. Thanks for watching.